Good afternoon. My name is Ann Brazo. I'm the founder and CEO of MPN Advocacy and Education International. With us today is um, a dear, <laughs> dear friend and um, a dear heart in the MPN community, Dr. Ruben Mesa. He is here to share with you what happened over the summer, starting with ASCO and ending, I think, pretty much with his um, a meeting that Dr. Mesa had recently. But he's going to share some slides with you and, and talk to you today about um, what has, what's been happening in the MPN community over the last several months. Dr. Mesa, thank you so much for being with us. Great, so apologize for, for the delay, some technical issues. Uh, and I think you guys have to give me permission to share. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, Mallory's doing that right now. <clears throat> you should be able to. There we go. All right, are you able to see my... Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, there you are. Excellent. Well, for those watching, a lot is going on in the MPN space. And rather than do it on a conference by conference basis, you know, let's try to synthesize things a little more because the conferences are frequently have very similar discussions because the, the updates are the updates, you know, on, on things which are evolving. Uh, but the conferences are important because they give the individuals a chance to, to interact see how trials are going, as well as plan the next generation of, of clinical trials, which are ongoing. Uh, and as you might imagine, they're much more productive in person than they have been in the virtual space where people can really set aside time aside to be able to sit together and, and interact to a, a much greater degree. So I'm gonna share with you slides that I just gave as an update to physicians involved with hematology care just at, at, at a hematology malignancy meeting in Indianapolis. It just occurred a couple weeks ago. So here are my disclosures, and I've been involved with most of the different agents in development. So if you think about MPNs, obviously those that are on this call recognize well that you're not all the same. Uh, uh, MPN patients, first, they're individuals. You have different a, ages, you live in different areas, you have different lives. Uh, diseases do not by any way define us. Even amongst the MPNs, the way that the diseases affect you can really be quite heterogeneous. And that is a very important piece as well. We know patients with ET, PV, and MF can be very different from one another. But even in those different groups, ET patients can have a very variable experience. PV patients can have quite a variable experience. MF patients can have a variable experience. And the diseases, of course, they themselves can evolve over time. Now, as we think about treating an MPN, you know, there's a couple, I think, universal statements. Now, these may change over time. But one, in general, we do not have a cure for these diseases. Now, that does not mean that there aren't a lot of people out there working trying to change that. We very much would like to be able to take these diseases away from you and cure them. That is the goal. That is the focus. It's difficult to achieve. There's a lot of diseases we have we've not been able to yet cure. Uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, Alzheimer's. You know, curing many diseases is difficult, but that, that clearly is the goal. However, short of a cure, our goal is to have you live your life as normally as possible, and hopefully as long as you were destined to live anyway. We all know life is, is a finite thing, whether our time is long or short, uh, but our goal is to truly have the MPN be the least impact on your lives possible. Now with that, we're very mindful of the ways it can affect you. Is there risk of blood clots or bleeding? Has that occurred in the past? Not everyone goes through this, but some do, and it's an important thing to try to prevent. Uh, are there low blood counts? Uh, and if so, uh, how do we help to have a, an impact on those low blood counts? Is there enlargement of the spleen? Uh, and if so, is it causing symptoms or difficulties? Uh, are there symptoms from the disease? Uh, is there a progression of the disease or risk of progression? And all of this, very much in the context of who you are. 
you know, if you're 75 and have other medical problems, how the disease affects you will be very different than the 30 year old that has a similar disease for many reasons. So let's talk a bit about ET and PD and some of the therapies in development. Now with ET, our current standard options out there include hydroxyurea, include anagrelide, include uh, pegylated interferon. And whether you're on a drug or which drug is defined by a series of guidelines that have been created called the NCCN guidelines. Now, all of these drugs have their pluses and minuses, and they help to control sometimes the symptoms. They aim to control the risk of vascular events, but they're not curative therapies, nor do they necessarily change the biology of the disease. So with this, there is real interest in developing new therapies. One such therapy that is in development is from a company called Imago that is a LSD-1 inhibitor, IMG-7289 or bomodemostat, has been looked at in trials both in ET and myelofibrosis. And in short, the hope for this drug is that it both helps to control high blood counts, but also has an impact on the biology of the disease because of the way that it works on the cells in your bone marrow. Now there's a clinical trial, both one that's been going on at my center, the Mays Cancer Center in San Antonio, but also going on in Europe, uh, a separate study where individuals with ET that had failed prior therapies, that had high counts, were treated with this uh, agent. And with this, both the trial in San Antonio, as well as this international study, the drug has been effective in helping to decrease the platelet count for some individuals that really have had very difficult platelet counts to control. People that had, that had previously been on and had difficulties with one, two, or all three of those other agents. Now, I mentioned earlier pegylated interferon. Pegylated interferon was looked at in a clinical trial through the MPN Research Consortium that Dr. John Mascarenas, myself, and many others led both a randomized study versus hydroxyurea, as well as a second line study. And it can help to control the platelets and it may have an impact on slowing progression of the disease. Pegylated interferon alpha-2A is not approved for ET, nor is there necessarily by those that hold the rights to the drug a plan to do so. So there's been a, a clear interest and desire to try to bring long-acting interferons as therapy for potentially ET. The ropegulated interferon alpha-2b or Besremi, uh, produced by Pharmacentia in the United States or by AOP in Europe, is approved in PV, and we'll get around to that in a moment. But Dr. Rasapchuk and I are leading a clinical trial for individuals who have ET. Now, this trial is a very specific trial. Although many patients with ET might benefit, clinical trials typically are trying to look at a benefit in a very specific subgroup of patients to try to obtain an approval. Uh, and in this circumstance, it's individuals with ET that have failed hydroxyurea who have both symptoms and an elevated white blood cell count. And they're randomized between this agent or an agrolide. And we're hopeful that this study, which is accruing in the US and in Asia, uh, will be able to show the benefit of this and help to extend the approval of ropegulate interferon alpha to B also to uh, ET. So if those criteria sound similar to what you're experiencing, certainly contact uh, Anne Brazo and she can help to connect you with one of the centers involved. Now, I'd mentioned that the ropegylate interferon alpha-2b is now approved in the U.S. It was approved in November of 2021, and it's exciting. It's the first time there has been a approval for a, an interferon in an MPN, even though there has been great enthusiasm for these agents for a long time. Now, these are some data shared at this uh, 
summer meeting at the European Hematology Association meeting in Vienna, uh, shared by Dr. Heinz Gisslinger. Now the study showed several things, long ability to control the blood counts, uh, probably superiority of helping to decrease the JAK2 allele burden compared to hydroxyurea. But in the single slide that I think is the most important, it showed that with long-term follow-up, the people that were on the ropegylated interferon alpha 2b compared to those who were on the control arm, the control arm was hydroxyurea, had a much better event-free survival. So what, what do I mean by an event-free survival? This is judged by not having one of those things we're trying to avoid. But what are we trying to avoid? One, clearly not having individuals pass away. Two, having the disease progress. Or three, a blood clot or bleeding event. So there's long been the thought that interference may decrease fibrosis if it's present, decrease the allele burden. But in this slide, that is a bit more relevant does it really help to uh, avoid or delay those things that we're really trying to avoid or delay? Death, progression, or thromboembolic events. So very important data, and I think further validates the consideration of ropegylate interferon alpha-2b in PV, and similar for the same reason why we're interested in, in ET. Now there's an additional group of agents that are of great interest for uh, P. vera. And these are agents that are analogs of something called hepcidin. Hepcidin is a molecule, is a protein involved with inflammation that may limit the ability of the bone marrow to make too many red blood cells, but without the necessity of individuals undergoing phlebotomy or being iron deficient. The drug that's furthest along in testing is this agent, resveratide. And there's new agents in this pipeline, including those from Ionis, that are working along the same mechanism of action. Now, the thought is, again, that these hepcidin mimetics have an impact and really suppress the overproduction of red blood cells and will limit the number of phlebotomies. Why that might be helpful? Really several reasons. First, when you're on phlebotomies, your hematocrit is always going up and down, which means that there's periods of time that is probably higher than we would like, and there's greater risk. There's also periods of time where it's higher and you have more symptoms. Uh, so we think that it may be more even control of both symptoms and risk if someone is evenly on, a, uh, on an agent like a hepcidin mimetic agent. Additionally, individuals would not need to undergo phlebotomy, which uh, creates iron deficiency and can be harmful. In data presented by Ron Hoffman at the American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting, they provided further updates showing how resveratide helped to have individuals become phlebotomy independent uh, after going on the therapy. And this has led now to a phase three study that is beginning to try to prove the case of this medication, aggregate its benefit, and seek an FDA approval. Now, let's pivot a bit to myelofibrosis. For many reasons, drugs are frequently tested in myelofibrosis first. Why is that? One, individuals tend to have a more severe disease so there's, there's a greater urgency in terms of the development of new therapies. Two, uh, the FDA feels it is an area of greater unmet need and provides a clearer path for both showing benefit as well as the necessity for an agent to be approved. And then not infrequently, as therapies then start in MF, they might evolve to other areas. So ruxolitinib is a prime example of this. It started as an approved agent in myelofibrosis, but then became approved in polycythemia vera uh, as a secondary step. 
Now we have three approved JAK inhibitors, ruxolidinib, fidradinib, and now pacridinib. We'll get into each of these in turn. We have uh, another JAK inhibitor close behind mamalotinib that we'll discuss. There are a range of different combinations. And so a very robust number of agents being tested for myelofibrosis. Now, ruxolidinib has been approved now for over a decade, and we have learned a great deal. Uh, it's been a very helpful medicine. And one of the things that we have noticed, in addition to its ability to benefit both the shrink the spleen when it's enlarged for patients for myelofibrosis, have them feel better, have a better quality of life, is that it probably extends life in myelofibrosis potentially even significant. It's not a cure, but there are individuals that have lived much, much longer than we would have ever anticipated who have been on ruxolidinib. And indeed, there's increasing data that some of the other JAK inhibitors, fedradinib, pacridinib, mamalodinib, may each have in turn their own impact potentially on, on helping individuals live longer, particularly if they are responding. So we think that the impact of JAK inhibitors is real and it can be uh, significant, which is why both JAK inhibitors, but then also JAK inhibitor combinations are really of greatest interest. There's probably less development of agents that are completely don't involve a JAK inhibitor at all, or some of those things in exception being individuals that have already previously had or lost benefit from JAK inhibitors. Medradinib approved much more recently in 2019. And this is, you can think of, it, it's a cousin of ruxolidinib, but with some important differences and tested very much in parallel clinical trials, both as the first JAK inhibitor a patient would receive, but also as the second JAK inhibitor a patient would receive. And that's particularly relevant as if this is an important agent for individuals that have MF that have failed ruxolidinib, this might be a good secondary option for them. And for individuals with a plate account of greater than 50,000. This was approved on the basis of, of a clinical trial that was randomized between placebo, and this was again several years ago, or two different doses of fedratinib where the fedratinib 400 milligrams a day, once a day being now the preferred dose. When patients begin on fedratinib, particularly in the frontline setting, they'll start on 400 a day. We will monitor a vitamin called thiamine. The one side effect of this medication is a very small percentage of individuals may have a decrease in thiamine or vitamin B1. If that's severe enough, that can cause some confusion or some, some cognitive Issue. So it's something that we monitor. It's something we have a fair amount of confidence now if we follow this process. It's not a significant risk, but it is an additional consideration with this agent. We start people on it. The drug can cause some nausea or diarrhea. So we typically start people on some medicines to try to prevent that upfront. And then we monitor for response. The third approved agent most recently is Procredinib, approved just this February. And this is a JAK inhibitor. They're all JAK2 inhibitors, but they're all different molecules and they have slightly different ways that they inhibit other proteins in the body, other effects that they have. And one of the things that had been noted with Procredinib from the beginning is that it inhibited some other proteins in addition to JAK2 that it could be used even in individuals with a very low platelet count, which had been a barrier. Uh, both ruxolidinib and fedradinib, neither one of which is FDA approved for individuals with a very low platelet count. So this was a, a distinguishing uh, feature. It was approved on the basis of several different clinical trials that have occurred, including this PERSIST-2 study. These were individuals with a plate account of under 100,000 with MF, whether they had had ruxolidinib or not uh, in the frontline setting, meaning as a first drug. 200 milligrams twice a day is the 
was the best, most effective, and the safest dose, and that is the recommended FDA dose. It's noted that even with a very low plate account of under 50,000, the platelets tend to stay stable or improve for individuals treated with the drug. So it's an important drug, particularly if platelets are low, either used alone at full dose to try to improve spleen and symptoms and outcomes, and will be tested and is, is being tested in combination with other combination approaches. Now, the fourth drug is mamalotinib. Mamalotinib is uh, a JAK2 inhibitor, also JAK1. And I presented these data on behalf of colleagues for in our US meeting, and Dr. Rashavchik presented it for European colleagues. Mamalotinib has been tested in several trials, but the data that I'm showing here are specifically for individuals that had had MF, they had anemia, and they had previously failed treatment with ruxolitinib. Patients were randomized to mamalotinib and placebo or danazol, which is a testosterone-like medicine that we have used in the past for helping anemia with the goal of trying to improve symptoms and anemia and enlargement of the spleen. The trial was very successful. It showed that mamalotinib was clearly superior to the control of danazol for helping to shrink or to decrease the symptoms that patients were facing. And again, individuals were blinded, so they didn't know which agent they were on. We also saw that it was significantly better for reducing the spleen. We had anticipated this. Uh, again, mamalodna being a much more comprehensive therapy for myelofibrosis, and danazol being the reality of the other options that we have. It primarily helps with only anemia. In terms of anemia, mamalodna was still better, both in terms of uh, the achievement of transfusion independence, you see going from 13 to 31%. Some improvement with Dan is also, it wasn't zero, but it, it was a little bit of increase. And then you see here, the improvement of mamalotinib versus Dan is all kind of over time. And then people after 24 weeks could, could switch from Dan is all to mamalotinib in the open label period, meaning everyone switched to get the mamalotinib. So how do the JAK inhibitors, <clears throat> where will they each fit? I think it depends a little bit on your situation. For individuals that have normal blood counts, what we call proliferative, meaning the platelets are above 50,000, ruxolitinib is probably still where we begin. Any one of the agents can be used, but which drug we start with, I put in a more bolded box. If you have good counts and you failed ruxolitinib, fidradinib has the clearest data for its use as a second line agent, particularly if your physician hematologist does not have a clinical trial to consider. Pacritinib clearly uh, has benefit both with low platelets or anemia and is a consideration. And once mamalotinib becomes approved, and of course that is, that is not a, a, a finished process, but at least anticipated, probably for the beginning of 2023, there will be, we will look closely at a variety of factors between pacritinib or mamalodinib, probably with low platelets favoring patients to receive pacritinib. And if anemia is the main driver, but platelets are okay, maybe mamalodinib. Any one of these drugs may be used in the second or third line setting. You may start with one of these, but depending upon how individuals do and respond, any one of them may be a consideration. Now, what about non-JAK inhibitors? So there's, there's a lot of activity of other agents being tested in clinical trials for MF that are looking at inhibiting other proteins in the body. Indeed, this is a partial list of truly two to three dozen different agents that are being looked at that in combination frequently with a JAK inhibitor or trying to leverage some other weakness in the disease to try to improve uh, outcomes. Let me share just a couple 
uh, of these that are, I'd say, the furthest along in development. One is the PET, the BET inhibitor called pelabrecid that uh, is being looked at combined uh, with ruxolitinib uh, for these uh, individuals. And here, this was a trial that had looked at several different scenarios, using it in second line, in combination, <clears throat> or in combination in front line. I think the, the data that has captured people's imagination the most is really the data in the frontline setting, where we have seen uh, very good rates of response for spleen and symptoms for combination in the beginning. So there currently is accruing the Manifest 2 study, oh, but both in my center, but many centers both in the US and internationally, comparing palabrasib plus ruxolitinib versus ruxolitinib for MF patients who need treatment who have not yet received uh, a JAK inhibitor. A second phase three trial in parallel being tested right alongside is Navidoclax. Navidoclax, uh, along with ruxolitinib as an add-on strategy for individuals with MF. Uh, and at uh, the EHA meeting, part of the ongoing data were being presented and there is an ongoing phase three study. And this was in, again, individuals who have not received a JAK inhibitor. So it's early on, but again, they're seeing combination and response in terms of spleen uh, and uh, durability of control in that panel on the right see the ability to improve symptoms. And again, we're learning more as we go. So where are we in terms of the panel of clinical trials? Well, as I share with others in other fields, there's never been a period with more clinical trials in MPNs than at this moment. So if whatever you're on with any of the diseases, if things are not going as you would like, it can be a time to consider whether a clinical trial may be a benefit. If you're on a therapy and you're doing perfectly fine, a clinical trial may not be the wisest approach. Indeed, a clinical trial is really done with the preconception that how, however you're doing now, there's the opportunity for you to do better. You know, if you're already doing well, it's very hard to do well and, and do better than doing well. It's not to say that as things evolve, even if you're doing well, that if we find a better therapy, uh, that you may change for it downstream once we know that it's a better therapy. So at the current time, we have trials for people that have truly failed the JAK inhibitor, of which the only one accruing at the moment is with imetilstat, it's a telomerase inhibitor for people that have failed other therapies with MF, hoping to extend life for individuals in that difficult circumstance. There are many more trials that are what we call the add-on trials, where you're adding other drugs to a base of ruxolitinib. Now, over time, this may evolve, not in the clinical trials, but in use, these drugs plus fedradinib, these drugs plus pacridinib, these drugs plus mamalotinib. Any of them may be considerations, but they're starting with as add-ons for ruxolitinib with the idea that you've been on RUX, you had a partial benefit, and then a second drug is being added on to try to have even that much more benefit. There are the combination from the get-go studies, two drugs at once to try to have a deeper or better impact on your disease, even if you've not had a therapy before. The majority of other significant blood diseases and you know, uh, bone marrow diseases like myeloma, lymphoma, and others, acute leukemia, almost all of them have people receiving more than one drug, one, two, three, or even four drugs. Indeed, in a multiple myeloma, a different disease, but a good example, four drug combinations have become the standard. I'm not saying we'll necessarily reach that point, but drugs can have complementary things that they can achieve. Now we're always cautious because drugs can also have additive side effects uh, or interact with one another. So 
we need to prove that these things are better than just receiving one drug by themselves. So these trials here are, let's say any one of these individual drugs with ruxolitinib compared to just people getting ruxolitinib anyway, which they would have gotten normally. So how do we put this all together? I, I think again, as it relates to myelofibrosis, things will evolve, meaning we have individuals uh, with low risk that in the frontline setting may be observed or interferon if they're not symptomatic or if they have symptoms like the ruxolitinib or a trial. If they have higher risk disease, and this, this somehow got compressed, my apologies, but if their platelets are low, procritinib, if they're anemic, probably a different approach for anemia along with mamelotinib or a combination, maybe rux with lisbatercept that can help to improve anemia. Or if the counts are standard, still probably ruxolitinib or fedradinib. Individuals with higher risk disease from the get-go, the natural combinations may be the most appropriate. In the second line, it's still very much based along these different parameters. We'll look at platelet count, spleen size, anemia, and risk in determining which of these new approaches may evolve. And then it's something that, again, we are seeing progress. Individuals with more aggressive disease that is moving more toward acute leukemia we will look at more targeted therapies, usually in combination with a consideration of stem cell transplantation. So putting this all together, if you think that, it's, that this sounds complicated, to some degree it is. You're all different. And because of this, we really try to evolve to more personalized care, meaning we need to know more about your disease. That may be the genetics, the mutations your disease have, your blood counts, but you're a lot more than your disease. You know, there is your health, your fitness, your age, your cardiovascular health, your family history, uh, your own goals and values, how aggressive you want to be with your health care, how you're feeling, uh, your employment status. All of these things can be important factors. I have offered the same option to two people of the same age and sometimes they'll make very different decisions based on all of these other factors. So that's why it's, uh, it's, it's good to try to come up with a good plan for what you're receiving, uh, what are the goals for that, what are the things to expect, as well as to ask, you know, what does success look like? Uh, or if we're not successful, what are the other options that we have, including clinical trials? So with that, I'll be opening it up to questions, but again, thanks to, to, to Anne and MP's NPN Advocacy and, and Education International for really being a, a leader in helping to, to, to bring these conversations forward. Indeed, one of the things that I think is uh, very helpful about the NPN community is it really is, is a community uh, with many different organizations, foundations, all working together uh, in parallel to try to make a difference for you the MPN Research Foundation, uh, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, the MPN Education Foundation, uh, and, and many different groups, the Global MPN Scientific Foundation, the MPN Advocates Network, many country-based societies as well. So with that, let me go ahead and stop sharing so that we can take uh, a, any questions that have arisen. Well, as usual, that was extremely informative, and we sit here and think we know it all until you come and join us, <laughs> and you bring us up to date, and it's always wonderful, not to mention it's wonderful to see you. And so um, a couple of questions um, about ruxolitinib. Um, many people do call us and say, you know, I've been on it for so many years. Is it still safe? Um, I'm doing okay. Um, this particular patient said um, they've been on rucks for five and a half years and they're stable and treatments quite well. And um, is this a drug that they can be on indefinitely? So the answer to that is, is yes. You know, we now have, you know, very long-term information for people on rucks, both with MF and with PV. And earlier this year, I saw a patient that had started on the initial phase one trial for MF back in 2010. 
Uh, and now this was 12 years later. And now the disease had progressed and we were needing to move in a different direction, but that was after 12 years. And it was not because of a negative of ruxolitinib, but you know, these therapies, again, we know they're not cured so that you know, people can progress, but in this circumstance, it took 12 years. You know, we do not know of a specific kind of long-term effect that, that time is against us, meaning saying at five years or 10 years or 15 years. Things we are mindful of, one, there is a, a, a clear, uh, not huge, but real increased risk of non-melanoma skin cancers. So people that are on ruxolitinib long-term, I think, do need to follow just with a dermatologist, whether they check your skin every six months or once a year will depend on a lot of things, including genetics, have you had a prior skin cancer, things of that nature. Two, probably should be vaccinated against shingles. If there is a little bit of increased risk of shingles that is real uh, with a the therapy. So those are probably the two, two most meaningful, but there's not, a, there's not a time limit. You know, there sometimes is a misconception amongst physicians that let's wait to use ruxolitinib until you're really sick. Overall, we have found that it's probably more effective to use it earlier rather than wait for the disease to be more advanced. And that's probably true for most MPN interventions. Okay, so sorry, I got kicked off there for a moment. Um, and the next question, thank you for that answer. We, you're, we hear that very, very often, you know, I've been on for so long and what should I expect? Um, what have you found to be an acceptable range for the hematocrit for PV patients taking hydria? So it's a good question. Regardless of what therapy you're on, uh, it is, uh, the goal is still to control the hematocrit under 45%. So whether you're on medicines or not, if the hematocrit is over 45%, you should probably have a phlebotomy. I had a patient ask me this earlier. Well, my hematocrit's over 45, should I just increase the dose of my medicine? And the answer to that is probably no. Uh, meaning, you know, our goal is to have relatively few phlebotomies ideally probably less than four a year. The goal is not to have zero, although if, if it's zero, that is fine, uh, but that uh, it is safest to have the hematocrit under 45. So when it's above 45, to have a hematocrit regardless of what medicine you're on. If the frequency of phlebotomies continues to be higher then over time, yes, your, your physician probably will increase the dose or consider whether a, a second drug might be more uh, appropriate. Okay, and then um, a question about Pegasus versus Besremi. And that is, you know, how do you determine which patient should get which drug? And, um, you know, have you been faced with that yet? So both are good drugs. And we have, you know, now long-term data uh, on each agent. There is no direct head-to-head -head data. For US patients, uh, ropegylated interferon or Besremi is FDA approved, or pegylated interferon alpha 2A or Pegasus is not. So if a patient has not been on either medicine, I start all new patient starts with PV for uh, ropeg or Besremi. Uh, for ET, uh, we still go off-label with the pegylate interferon alpha 2A until there is potentially an approval. Now, should people with pegylate interferon alpha 2A switch to Besremi? One, that is an option for them. Uh, is it necessary? Uh, I think it depends. If someone is doing perfectly fine on pegylate interferon alpha 2A, they figured out how to get it, their insurance company is covering it. Their co-pays are manageable. There's probably not a strong need to have to change that. Uh, but if they wanted to, I don't think there would be a, a harm. Uh, if you're on pegylate interferon alpha 2A, but you're not doing well, there's a side effect. Uh, that could be liver function tests. That could be other flu-like symptoms. Certainly, the switch could be a, a consideration. 
But, but the, at the moment, there is no head-to-head -head data, you know, to suggest, you know, to, to prove one is better than the other. They're similar medicines, but a couple subtle differences. One, the, the uh, part of the medicine that makes it be long-acting is different between them, which allows the ROPEG to be administered at a lower frequency. There is the practical matter that because it is FDA approved, there's a company out there that acts as a resource, both for treating physicians and for patients, if they have questions, if they need assistance, if they have an insurance issue. And there are a lot of advantages to being on an FDA approved therapy when one is available to you. Absolutely. Plus uh, assistance with um, um, paying for the drug as well. And so um, this patient asks, you, you've mentioned many drugs that are JAK2 or JAK related. Um, is there anything that is most useful for patients that are not um, JAK, um, do not have the JAK2 gene uh, mutation? For example, this patient just has a CalR Cal -R mutation. It's an excellent question. At the moment, even with the JAK inhibitors, all of the agents discussed are not specific for which mutation you have. That may change over time, but not at the moment. So if for the MF trials, they've all included patients with, with CalR or JAK2 or MPL, uh, and usually with fairly uh, similar results. So at the moment, it, it does not matter. That may change over time. There are some therapies such as vaccine therapies that are very, very early in development directed against calreticulin that will be specific for people with that mutation. But at the moment, uh, having a JAK2 mutation is not required to receive any of these treatments. Can JAK inhibitors work with those who are triple negative ET patients? Yes, really for the same reason. So why does it not matter? The reason is that regardless of which mutation, JAK2, CalR, or MPL, or even being triple negative, we believe that uh, the JAK STAT pathway, which is the core pathway, is uh, overly activated in all patients. So that is really what these agents are really trying to, to decrease. That is something they share, even though how they got there is, is different between them. Uh, it, does not, uh, it does not matter between them. Okay. And any comment on the combination of ruxolitinib and is it Selnexar? That is a combination that is uh, early on in its testing. So uh, again, I think a you know, relatively small number of people have been tested. It's, it's an example of, of other combinations that are kind of less advanced in terms of their testing, but certainly we'll be you know, trying to follow uh, those uh, results along with the others. And can LSD1 be used for PV as well as ET? They do have a study that is beginning uh, in PV. So uh, my sense is it probably will be active. It's been active in MF, it's been active in ET. I think highly likely that it will be helpful uh, but uh, we don't have trial data yet. So we have a lot of new patients with us today, um, Dr. Massa, and one of the questions is, what is the difference between primary and secondary PB? So when we speak of polycythemia vera, that is really a primary illness, meaning there's a mutation, the JAK2, and that is the reason for the blood counts being increased. Uh, secondary erythrocytosis or a secondary cause of too many red blood cells is not an MPN. That would be, again, an increase in red blood cells due to a variety of things. Living at high altitude, uh, sometimes there are kidney tumors that can produce too much hormone, sleep apnea, uh, men who take uh, too much testosterone as a supplement, but that is a critical. So there really is no such thing as really secondary polycythemia vera. 
Polycythemia vera is really an illness. Secondary erythrocytosis is too many red blood cells for any other reason. Critical that people, you know, that that be distinguished because people with secondary erythrocytosis, uh, one, we don't think they have risk of blood clots. Two, they don't have an MPM. Uh, they don't have a likelihood of disease progression and certainly shouldn't be on any of these medicines that we've discussed. And one last question. Actually, I'll, I'll make this quick. Two, two last questions. <laughs> um, one is in regards to um, vaccinations again, because I just had my fifth, uh, my, my third or second booster. And this one was for Omicron and, and supposedly covering everything. And thank God I have not had um, um, the disease or the virus. But what is your recommendation now for our patients? I know early on we said, yes, 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 get this vaccination, get the booster shots. Are you still recommending the, the current booster shot? Yes. You know, we have no data to say that MPN patients should have any different recommendations for vaccination than the general public. You know, early on there was the concern whether people on ruxolitinib may have less of a response to the vaccine in terms of an antibody response. That being said, they probably still had a partial immune response, a T cell response, and probably still had some benefit. I would highly encourage everyone to receive the new bivalent vaccine. The new vaccine covers a much broader spectrum of COVID and you know, everyone should receive that. I too went out and I got my fifth injection to get the bivalent vaccine. It covers a lot more of the virus. And that's for anyone, pretty much anyone, if it's been more than two months since you had another booster, or I think a handful of weeks if you've had COVID itself. Right, right. absolutely, I'm with you 100%. And then um, finally, in, any final words to our, our guests that are with us today? I mean, my gosh, it just so much is happening. I'm, I'm always astounded every time we meet. I just can't believe it. So I, I, I would hopefully have people leave from today's discussion with really a tremendous sense of hope, meaning, you know, as I think back in my career 15 years ago, we had no agents that were approved and we had not yet understood the, the real drivers of why people develop the disease, the genetics or other pieces. Now we truly have, you know, dozens of agents that are being tested. Now for some people, you know, this quantity of information can cause a bit of anxiety. I hope that that's not the case. People say, I wanna be on all of the trials. It's okay if you're doing well, stay put, be on your therapy, let all of this work its way through. You know, there, there's a reason these trials are very specific to really try to understand in the quickest amount of time and with the, the least number of individuals, which drugs are helpful and why and for which patients so that we can develop better options for for individuals and we can have a greater impact on the disease. In the future, I think other things will be coming. New therapies potentially against the genetics of the disease with platforms such as CRISPR. Those are not ready yet, but, but they will come. Uh, uh, vaccine strategies, uh, immune-based therapies or others. So many reasons to be hopeful. Uh, and again, also the confidence that once therapies are really impactful for you, the best situation is for you to be perfectly stable on the therapy that you're on. And the reason that you're changed is because we have found a new therapy that's even that much better. Yeah. I'm, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. I know you have to run. I so, so, so much appreciate your time. I know you're so busy these days and um, I know our patients appreciate you very much and I'll be in touch. Thank you again and have a great day. Great, it was an honor to be here. I hope everyone is doing well, thank you. Thank you so very much. Bye-bye. So with that, um, just so you know, we did record this and uh, we will have it available probably by tomorrow.
Our next in-person event will be November 18th in Boston. You should have received information about that. We have four MPN experts there and a couple other speaker, speakers will be joining us. We will be hosting another webinar in October and we will keep you apprised of when that is um, and make sure that you can join us. Thank you very much for being with us today. And um, I hope you all go out and get your booster shot. Take care. Bye-bye.